So first, what are the geosciences? Well, for one, they're awesome, but why? They're awesome because this can be your classroom. But really, what is geoscience? Well, basically, geoscience is the study of Earth and its landforms, such as this rock feature, which is called an outcrop. And notice how the dark band looks like the rock got folded, which is really cool. Or geoscience is also the study of Earth's processes, like how rivers, such as the Potomac, as shown here, how that shapes the Earth and causes erosion. Or what about Earth systems, such as the hydrologic cycle shown here. And here you can see the clouds, you can see some of the rain coming down, and you obviously know that there's groundwater underneath the surface that is supporting all of the plants, like the grass and the trees and stuff. Also, geoscience studies Earth's natural resources, like gravel pictured here, which is used to build roads, buildings, and infrastructure. And finally, we also study the impact on people, like natural disasters as demonstrated by this lava flow found in Hawaii, which is threatening a neighborhood. And there's so much more out there. So who are geoscientists? In general, they study all of these different things about the Earth. And I'm actually going to introduce you to some of the real practicing geoscientists that I interviewed for this project. The first is Vicki McConnell, and she is the chief geologist and the director of the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, which is basically the name of the Oregon State Geological Survey. In general, state surveys provide geoscientific information, regulations, and data to each state, such as mapping the surface, they identify the state's natural resources, and they map different natural hazards, like fault lines for potential earthquake risks, for example. This is Carrie Suffer, and she is a meteorologist at the National Weather Service, which is actually based here in Washington, D.C. Carrie is responsible for monitoring the weather, she tracks storms, and she is also responsible for informing the community of potential weather risks and severe weather systems. And lastly, Mike Lawless is the vice president of a medium-sized environmental engineering consulting company, which is found in Virginia, and it's called Draper Aiden Associates. And as a consultant, Mike works on water resources projects, he works on solid waste, and he basically works to find clean sources of water and cleans up contaminated sites. He also works with clients to make sure that they comply with state and federal regulations regarding water resources. And these are just a few examples of what professional geoscientists can do. So keep these folks in mind because we're going to revisit them later in the presentation. So majoring in the geosciences. First of all, there are over a thousand different geoscience departments um, in institutions of higher education across the United States alone. Though not every school will have a geoscience department specifically, most actually offer geoscience courses that you can take. So plus, if you're interested in becoming a geoscience major, you can look at the many different types of institutions who offer a geoscience degree. So geoscience departments come with many different names, and I want you to be aware of all of these different names in case if you come across any of them. So they can include a lot of these titles and any combination of these titles. So I'm going to go through some examples. The first is Purdue University's Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences Department. The next is Boston University's Department of Earth and the Environment. The third is Northern Arizona University's Department of Geography, Planning, and Recreation. And my last example is Humboldt State University's Department of Oceanography. So if you ever have a question on whether or not a specific department is actually considered part of the geosciences, you can totally feel free to email me, and I'll let you know if we consider it part of the geosciences or not. So what can you do with a geoscience degree? Say you wanted to major in the geosciences, well, what do you do now? There are some of the more traditional types of jobs, just like the ones that we talked about, like with Vicki, Carrie, and Mike. But did you know that geoscientists are actually employed in a huge variety of occupations that you're probably already familiar with? They can be lawyers, graphic designers, and even doctors. So picture here, 
on the right hand side is AGI's past, past policy fellow Aisha Morris. So in general, policy fellows spend about 12 months in Washington, D.C. as a staff member, and they're science advisors in the office of one of the members of Congress. And so they basically make practical contributions to federal le legislation on pertinent geoscience topics which relate to the environment. They can talk about natural resources, hazards, and even impact federal science policy. So that's just one example. So I want you to take a look at this image. If you receive the Careers That Change the World brochure, you can find this image um, on the very last page, so that way it might be a little bit easier for you to read if you have that handy. The big idea surrounding this figure is the importance of integrating your interests and your transferable skills to geoscience. Your general interests and your transferable skills are really, really important to consider when you're thinking about what type of career you want to pursue after college. So, for example, say if you like to play video games. I love to play video games because I'm a total nerd. What are some of the skills that are needed to really be a good video game player? Well, one, you need problem-solving skills because that allows you to complete certain missions within the video game. You also need good spatial thinking and reasoning skills, so that way you can really understand your virtual environment and where you're, you're going. You would also potentially need good hand-eye coordination, so that way you can physically play the game. Those are just some, some of my ideas. But how can you relate those things to a geoscience career? Well, first, you would need those really strong problem-solving and those spatial thinking skills to really be able to read, to produce, and even analyze maps or, for example, to create visualizations for theoretical models. So first, how do you read this picture? There's a lot going on in this image, so I'm going to break it down for you so you can read it a little bit more easily. So first, if you look in the center, there are five inner rings. Each of these inner rings represents a sector within the geoscience work workforce in which geoscientists are employed. So, as a geoscientist, you can work at a nonprofit like I do, or you could work in academia like your teachers or professors, or you can even work in the government like Vicki McConnell at the Oregon State Survey, or you could work in industry like Mike Lawless because he's a consultant, or you can work straight up in research. So, next, radiating out from these central rings are wedges. And each of these wedges represent the different interests or the different disciplines that geoscience intersects. These, these interests in these disciplines can include things like policy, like Aisha Morris, um, or writing, law, business, medicine, and art. Now, looking at where the wedges intersect the rings, that indicates in which workforce sector you can find these disciplines. Now, inside each of these wedges are examples of the different types of occupations a geoscientist can have. So this image is not meant to be encompassing every every little aspect of the geoscience workforce, but it's really just a tool to help you think about the geosciences and think about the job market differently. So there are many more things out there that we didn't include in this picture because the picture would be way too big. So now what I'm going to do is go through some examples of more non-traditional geoscience occupations. So that way you get an idea of what, what other occupations are out there. The first is in medicine. And this basically studies the relationship between geological factors and health in humans, animals, and plants. So there are doctors and medical researchers who study the effects of mercury and arsenic on the body, or there are doctors out there who work to treat victims of asthma from natural dust or even volcanic eruptions. So there are many different ways that one can apply their geoscience knowledge to health and medicine. And actually, in fact, there is a national conference called the Med Geo Conference, and it's going to be held here in Washington, D.C. in August. And so during that conference, they're going to discuss a lot of these different relationships and these factors of how medicine intersects geoscience, which is really cool. So the second example is in law. So you can be a lawyer, 
who takes cases that are specifically involved land use or land management or even environmental regulations. Or you could be a forensic scientist, just like on CSI, who use geoscience knowledge to solve criminal cases. Like, for example, geoscientists can do soil and sediment analyses on the bottom of people's shoes to determine where they've been or to, de to determine if a dead body has been moved, if the sediment on the clothes doesn't match where the body was actually found. And so they use these as clues to really help inform police officers and folks investigating the crime. In business, as a geoscientist, you can actually be a financial advisor. And this is a particularly lucrative career. You can make a lot of money doing this. Um, geoscience financial advisors assess the technical veracity of investments, and they basically determine whether or not an investment is a sound one. So they can do this because they understand the subtle nuances of market supply and demand of geoscience resources and natural commodities. And so they can actually advise companies and investors on whether or not to make a transaction Say for gold, for example, they know um, the demand of gold and the supply of gold and they can help inform companies and investors on whether or not that price of gold is too high or too low. And my last example is in art. So you need geoscientists who understand all of those really complex natural processes that are really hard to visualize. Um, and you need them to communicate these very complex problems and ideas to the public. So oftentimes, these are great opportunities for folks with graphic design backgrounds, um, who have illustration backgrounds, or even have experience in sculpting. So sculptors, for example, are scientists, often find employment in art studios that develop the life-size models of animals. So when you go to a museum like the Smithsonian out here, you see all of those life-size models of dinosaurs and stuff. They actually need geoscientists who understand the paleontology of dinosaurs and who are artists so they can accurately replicate what that dinosaur could have looked like. <clears throat> So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Now that you have a better understanding of the types of jobs that are out there for geoscientists, let's look at some of the history and the trends that we've seen in the geoscience workforce. And this will give you a little bit more context. So looking at this graph, this represents how many geoscience degrees have been granted over the past 40 years or so. And so AGI, where I work, we track the number of degrees granted because it gives us a really good measure of the overall health of the geoscience discipline. And it does this because it shows really the supply of geoscientists who could potentially go into the workforce. This next graph shows where geoscience degree recipients traditionally have become employed. So typically, I say this a lot, in the geosciences, the master's degree is considered the professional degree. And so as you can see here, that is really reflected in the percentage of master's students who find employment in the private sector. You see this dark blue bar here, about 50% of those with master's degrees actually go into the private sector. But not surprisingly, most, most PhD students actually stay in academia. So that means they're basically following a career path um, to be researchers and, and professors. However, even though we've seen a lot of these similar trends in the past, um, we're noticing that these are actually changing. So more organizations and more companies are actually hiring at the bachelor's degree level. Um, and so that is going to be really, really good news for when you finish your geoscience degree or whenever you're coming out of college, because that whole system is starting to change right now. So those previous slides really looked at what happened in the past and some of those previous trends. Now I'm going to talk about what's going on right now and what we think is going to happen within the next 10 years or so. So right now, there are over a quarter of a million jobs in the geosciences that exist today. So that includes my job, it includes Vicki McConnell's job at the survey, and it even includes your teacher's and your professor's jobs. So this graph shows the age distribution of geoscientists. Now, notice how there's a huge cohort right in the center here. 
And that attributes for about 50% of our geoscience professionals who are currently in their late 50s, mid to late 50s, which means that they're going to be reaching retirement age really, really soon. So once they retire, a lot of their jobs are going to open up. And those people who are in the mid-career positions, they're going to be promoted to those higher level positions. And then that's going to open up the entry level positions and the early career occupations. And it's those types of jobs that will be filled by graduating geoscientists from college. So that big cohort, that 50% of retiring geoscientists, that roughly equates to 130,000 people. <clears throat> so in addition to that, the Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that an additional 72,000 jobs are going to be created within the next five to 10 years. So some of these jobs don't even exist right now, um, but they're going to be created and they will exist by the time that you um, graduate college. So that's really good news. So remember when I said that the master's degree is a professional degree in the geosciences? Well, hypothetically, if we were to hire every single geoscientist who came out with a master's degree or a PhD degree, we would only be able to fill 15,000 of these jobs that are opening up. Or if we were to hire everyone in the United States with a bachelor's degree in geoscience, then that would boost our numbers up to about 45,000 jobs that we could fill. Unfortunately, it's just not enough. And this still leaves us with a net deficit of over 150,000 geoscientists by 2021. So that is a huge, huge, huge demand. So what happens when there is a huge demand in any one particular area? Well, a huge demand um, comes with competitive salaries. So this graph shows the median annual salaries of geoscience-related occupations, and then it compares them to other general occupations. So if you look at the bolded bars, those are the general occupations. So all of the man management occupations are found in the dark blue bar. All of the architecture and engineering positions are the gold bar. All of the science, the life, physical, and social sciences, they're found in the dark red bar. And then all of the education, library sciences, they're all in the green bar. So in general, the geoscience occupations, which are in the lighter color bars in each of these sections, you can see that in general, the geoscience occupations actually make more money than the broad occupations. So in addition, if you look at that thick black horizontal line, that represents the annual salary of all U.S. occupations, which is less than $35,000 a year. So you can see as a geoscientist, you're actually making considerably more money than the median annual salaries of other occupations. <clears throat> so we're going to switch gears again, and I'm going to talk to you about how to actually land one of these jobs once you graduate college. So I'm going to revisit some of our professional geoscientists that I previously introduced you to, and I'm going to share with you some of their advice that they gave me. So Vicki's main message um, is all about transferable skills. So reading the white part of the text, Vicki says, the one thing that everyone should take away from every job that they've ever had is that you learn something in anything you do. You should be developing some skill set that comes out of that, and you build on that. So this kind of comes full circle with the discussion that we had earlier about that infographic with the transferable skills. Figure out what you like, what you're good at, and use those things to bolster your geoscience career. So if you actually read at the bottom part of her quote, she says, I learned much of my people management skills from being a bartender. How awesome is that? So really, you really are learning and you take away a lot of information from anything you do. And that experience is going to help you later on in your career. So Carrie's advice here is all about the importance of communication. So she says, communication, communication, communication. 
Learning how to explain technical information to a layperson is really important. And that's just something you don't learn in undergrad. So even as scientists, it's really important to remember that you need to clearly and concisely communicate your research and your science, no matter how complex it is, to your stakeholders. Because after all, if you can't really help others understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, then you're going to really find it hard to have much of an impact, even if it's really relevant and really important. So I really highly advise you to practice your writing skills. You know, take a public speaking course if you can um, in college. Those things are really going to help you out a lot in your career. The last piece of advice is from Mike. And he really talks about the importance of networking and how would networking really work specifically in the geosciences. So Mike says, a lot of opportunities don't get advertised. If your resume crosses a desk and somebody is looking to fill a position, you can get a job without having to wait for something to be advertised. And that's the networking thing. Get your qualifications out to as many people as you can and talk to as many people as you can. So networking really is arguably the most important aspect to consider when you're looking for a job. But why is networking so important? Well, first, it's a great way to gather information about what different types of opportunities are out there. So you can get information about geoscience degrees if you're still considering that. Um, you can get information about what types of geoscience careers are out there. You know, there's just a lot of information out there, and you can get that information just from talking to people. It's also a great way to meet new people. So it's whether it's meeting new colleagues, new professors, advisors, or even potential employers. And that's what's great about networking, is that it's really an exponential process. So the more people you know, the higher potential you have for meeting even more people, which makes sense. And lastly, networking is a great way to form a professional and even a personal relationship. You can meet um, academic advisors who will help you with your research. You can meet mentors who are going to help you, um, help guide you through your classes and your coursework. So um, there are a lot of people out there who just really want to genuinely help college students. So don't be shy to talk to new people and make those connections. And honestly, it's never too early to start networking. Plus, these days, you have so many tools to help you with that process. Like, use social media to your advantage. We all know how to use Facebook. We all probably know how to use Twitter. So use it. Um, many school departments, actually, and employers and companies have Facebook pages. So you can click through to their pages. You can get more information from them. Um, you can also create a professional LinkedIn profile, and that will help you connect with, like, professors, It'll help you connect with, like, colleagues and even potential employers as well. So you can even use Twitter, which is kind of awesome. So my good friend and colleague here at AGI, she always tells this story. Um, and she says that when she graduated with her geoscience degree, she actually tweeted that she was looking for a job in the geosciences. And Chesapeake Energy, which is a natural gas company, they tweeted back at her. And they told her to go to the careers webpage, and they basically gave her an application for a job. So basically, social networking really works. Use it to your advantage. Um, also, other than social networking, there are a lot of um, professional societies and federal agencies that are out there that you can connect with. So within AGI, what we are is we're a federation of membership societies. And so listed here, GSA, AGU, um, these are some of the professional societies that are out there that belong to AGI. And so you can get more information on our website about how to connect with professional societies. And really, they're a great way to connect with other people. So networking with people in professional societies, it can really lead you to a lot of scholarship opportunities, internship opportunities, and fellowship opportunities. So there's a lot of money out there in the geosciences. You might as well, you know, get your, get your uh, money's worth when you go to school because you will have opportunities to get that. Um, Plus, if you end up going to a lot of these professional societies meetings, um, you're going to have an opportunity to present your own research to the community. So that's pretty cool, too. Um, they also have a lot of different opportunities um, to get career information. They have career booths. They have networking lunches. 
Um, you can attend workshops. You can go on field trips. Um, and they have a lot of different activities and things that you can do while you're at the meeting. So I definitely recommend going to those if you ever have that opportunity. So here are some other um, informational resources for you. There's just a lot of information out there about the geosciences. So feel free to look through AGI's workforce website, which is listed here. It's www.agiweb.org slash workforce. Um, and we have a lot of resources for you that really uh, talk about the geoscience workforce, what are some of the trends, you know, some of the things that I discussed earlier. <clears throat> and we actually also have a scholarship um, specifically for women. And the scholarship is for women who are getting their master's degrees or their PhDs in geoscience. And so it's a $5,000 award per year for up to two years. So eventually, if you end up getting your geoscience undergraduate degree, and if you're a woman and you want to end up going to try to get your master's or your PhD, we have this potential scholarship for you. So it's just something to think about. There are a lot of resources out there um, for you to take advantage of. Also, AGI is responsible for developing the materials and the activities that you find in Earth Science Week. So if you want more about Earth Science Week, um, you can go to their website and kind of peruse around and see what they have, they have available for you there. <clears throat> so right now what I'd like to do is open up the floor for a discussion. Um, I'm here as a resource to you, so if you have any questions about anything that I've talked about or um, about the geosciences in general, this is a great time to ask those questions. You can either type them into the chat box, or if you want, you can press the raise your hand button. And if you have a microphone um, attached to your computer, then I can unmute you and you can actually directly talk to me. So with that, we have a question coming in. Yes, this presentation is going to be online. So what we're doing is right now I'm recording this presentation. and um, once I edit it and put it up, we're going to put it online on our website, and it'll be a free link, and you guys can directly download it and watch it as many times as you want. So I'm going to make this resource available to everyone. So what I'll do is once this um, video is online, I'm going to send out an email to those email addresses that you registered this with, and then that way you'll know where to find the presentation. Are there any other questions? Remember, if you have a microphone, you can press the raise your hand button, and that'll let me know that you want to talk, too. So someone asked, how many students right now are in attendance? Um, right now, we have 14 people on the line. I think originally we had 30 people registered for this webinar, so about half of those people are here. So there's a really good question about natural disasters. This person asks, I was curious about jobs having to do with natural disasters. Do you know about any of them? So basically, natural disasters, um, they're really, really important because they have really high impact on our society, right, in general. So I think there are a lot of different types of natural disasters that, that scientists study. Um, for example, you know, you have meteorologists who look at severe weather, such as like the tornadoes that just happened in Oklahoma. Um, so with so stuff like that, you definitely want to go more into meteorology, um, and that has a lot of math. It has a lot of computer work. It has a lot of modeling. And so if you're really interested in doing stuff like that, it's really cool. You can work for the National Weather Service, like Carrie. Um, I gave that example earlier. Um, if you're more interested in, say, tectonics, and you are interested in like volcanoes and earthquakes and those types of things, um, the U.S. Geological Survey 
is a federal agency that basically it has a lot of different branches. It's a huge, huge organization. But one of the things that they do is they monitor the risks of natural hazards and they try to mitigate those risks by developing new research and better technologies that can predict things better. Um, and so that would be a great career path for you if you're looking to get more into tectonics. You can also do state surveys too, so that's still a government organization. Um, so each state has its own survey that does research um, a lot about a lot of different things. So those are some options too. So there's a great question about how geoscience is involved in engineering, in energy, and in business. So in engineering, it's really, really important because engineering is all about developing something from nothing, right? They are the big creators. They, they develop instrumentation. They develop structures and stuff. So, for example, um, we need petroleum engineers or geological engineers that can go and help, help figure out the best way to extract energy resources like oil or like natural commodities like gold or like copper and silver. So we actually need the people to design the tools that we use to be able to extract those types of things. And so that's, you know, that's just one example of like an engineering. Um, for energy, energy is talked about in a lot of different ways. We have, we're, you know, we're developing new technologies in solar energy. There's geothermal energy. So taking and producing energy from the heat from within the earth. Um, there's also more traditional fields like natural gas um, and petroleum. So those are a lot of different things. Um, another question came in. When choosing between majoring in mining engineering and standalone geology, which is more transferable? So mining engineering is basically a really specific type of degree. And very few um, colleges and institutions actually have that as a major. Like Colorado School of Mines is one of the few that has that. And so you're basically getting into a really, really focused um, pathway, which is awesome because it's in really, really high demand. If you do standalone geology, you're probably going to get a little bit more of a broader picture of what is all out there and then you can apply that to a lot of different areas and what you want to do. So it's really dependent on if you want to kind of stay really focused in mining engineering and get that degree which would be very lucrative and it's very niche because not very many people can do that or if you do general geology which would open up a lot of huge different career opportunities. So it's kind of what you would like to do. Um, how important is specific undergrad coursework? Let's see. So it looks like this person has different um, academic tracks in, in his department. And really, he's asking how will his choice between each of these different tracks affect his postgrad opportunities. So really, it's... It's though each of those tracks are a focus. And what I like to emphasize here is that idea of transferable skills again. So as you're going through your geoscience degree, no matter what track that you're going through, you're going to be learning a lot of content information, a lot of big, broad information. And then with each track, you'll be getting into more specific things like petroleum or like environmental geoscience, etc. But really, Geoscience is so applicable to so many different things. It's what you make of it. So you can actually use a lot of that content knowledge from any one of those specific things and really apply it to anything you do. Um, so really what I would advise is follow what you're most interested in and what really intrigues you the most. And then during the course of your undergraduate career, just talk to people, talk to professionals, get involved in the professional societies and ask them like, you know, what career opportunities are there with my interests and my skill sets? 
and really they're going to help guide you. And if you ever have a question on if you want to pursue a certain type of career and you have a question on what types of courses you should really be taking, all you have to do is go try to find someone who has a similar type of career that you'd like to pursue and ask him or her what they did or what they advise you to take, what types of other math classes that you need or what, you know, maybe you'll need mineralogy and petrology um, and paleontology for something that you didn't realize and you have no idea. So really just go out to the employers and ask them. And quite honestly, you really should have no fear of picking up the phone and calling people because generally people love talking about what they do and they're really excited to talk to graduate students and college students about what they do to get them interested in. So yeah, my advice for you is just talk to the employers out there and see what advice they have for you. Um, there is a question about which specific career paths within the geosciences um, are the most promising careers to provide jobs after college. In general, um, there are definitely jobs and occupations which are more popular or more employable. Um, in general, the geosciences have a lot of opportunity out there. So like I was talking about the financial advisor, actually that's a really important one right now because we have so many um, natural resources and commodities out there that we're trying to figure out new and better ways to extract and get at. The financial advisors can really help determine where the demand is and you know, versus how much the supply is. So that's kind of a hot one right now. Also, anything having to do with national security is really, really hot, too. So basically, with national security, you're going to need to understand how to develop, how to analyze maps, how to read them, um, anything having to do with geomorphology, which is basically looking at um, surficial processes of the Earth and how, how the Earth becomes reshaped and stuff, all of those things um, are really, really important when you're looking at national security issues. And so in national security, I mean, you can work for the FBI, you can work for the CIA, that type of thing. Um, let's see. Will this webinar be taped? Yes, the re webinar is definitely being recorded right now, um, along with all of this discussion, and I'm going to put it online. So I'll send you all a link um, for whenever it's up online, and you can review it again and again and share it with your friends and share it with whoever you want. Um, there is a person who asked, um, they're interested in mission or NGO work overseas, and can you do that as a geoscientist? Yes, and in fact, there are a lot of international opportunities out there for geoscientists. So geoscientists, basically, geoscience is the study of all of the Earth and all of its aspects, right? And so, by definition, it is a very, very international type field. You're going, you know, you if you want to travel, you can make that happen. You will have opportunities to travel wherever you want in the world. If you don't want to travel, there are definitely a lot of jobs here in the U.S. that you can apply for as well. And so it just really depends on what your interests are um, and, you know, what your skill sets are and kind of what you want to do to look for those international jobs. And again, look at those professional societies. There are international professional societies as well, and they can help guide you in that direction. And actually, speaking of international associations, um, there is an international association called the YES Network, Y-E-S, the YES Network. And basically what they are, it's a group of about 3,000 geoscientists, and um, it's an international organization. And so they're basically focused on early career geoscientists and how to help early career geoscientists, through, you know, progress in their careers, give them resources, give them information. And so you can sign up for free for um, a membership to the YES Network. And so that will actually help connect you with people from all over the world. And so that can help you make those international ties if, if you'd like to do that. 
how much do I enjoy my line of work? Um, I love it. I love what I do. And I'm actually really fortunate because I kind of found my dream job. And I know that sounds super cheesy. Um, but to give you a little bit of background on myself, um, for my undergrad, I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I originally studied astronomy and astrophysics. So when I was about a junior or senior, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, man, this is really, really hard, <laughs> and I don't want to sit at a computer for the rest of my life counting photons and running stats and doing a whole bunch of that stuff, right? And so what I found is um, I started taking geology classes, and I switched my major from astrophysics to astronomy and planetary science. And so in my geology class, um, they were actually doing geoscience education research. So they were basically trying to figure out what were students' interests and what were students' attitudes towards that particular geology class. And so I got involved with that type of research, educational research. And so that led me to go... Um, into my graduate program, which was at Purdue University, and I studied geoscience education research. And so I basically looked at why did students decide to major in the geosciences and what types of careers they were planning on pursuing. And so with that research, that led me to my current position, which is kind of my dream job, because not only am I a scientist and I still get to do my own research, but I'm really heavily involved within the scientific community. I talk and I work with other scientists all out there, and I really get that interaction with people just like you guys who are on the line because I get to talk about the things I love. So it's pretty sweet to do what I do, and that's just, you know, what my interests are. And this is a type of job that I never knew existed. Like when I was an undergrad and even a graduate student, I had no idea I could work at a nonprofit and do what I do. But there are a lot of jobs out there in a lot of those different sectors. So it's just a matter of networking and trying to figure out what are your interests and what are you good at, and then trying to merge them together. <clears throat> so there's another question. Other than the USGS and the Department of the Interior, um, what government agencies employ people with geoscience backgrounds? Um, that's a good question. The Department of Defense and the Department of Energy as well. Um, so the Department of Defense, all of those careers um, I was talking about with national security and having to use mapping, GIS, geomorphology, all of that stuff is really, really important. The Department of Energy is really important because that's all about energy resources and all of that. You also have NOAA, which is the National Oceanographic Administration, yeah, an Atmospheric Administration, sorry, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. And so they do a lot of stuff with um, weather patterns, climate, um, lots of those types of things, too. And you also have the National Weather Surface, which is where Carrie Suffern works as well as a meteorologist, and I showed her picture up here a couple times. So I hope those give you a few more examples. Um, there is someone who is interested in water purification and asks, um, is water purification um, geoscience related um, in both first and third world countries? And yes, huge, huge, huge demand for water resources. I mean, water resources, like the management of water resources, the extraction of water resources, making sure that everyone has clean drinking water. I mean, that is a huge, huge field. And geoscience, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and that's kind of falling into more of, I guess, the environmental consulting and engineering um, fields, um, where you do a lot with resource management. Because you're basically looking at water and how it flows under the surface as groundwater and how, you know, what, what, what reservoirs and aquifers and stuff there are. Um, and so, you, you know, there are a lot of regulations that you have to follow. You can help write regulations. Um, and so that water, water resources, that's really big here in the United States and the Southwest. Um, it's obviously really big across the world, you know, in Africa, for example. Um, and really anywhere you go, anywhere you go, you're going to need water. So it's really, it's really important. 
Um, there's a really great question. How valuable are programming and other advanced computer skills? Huge. They are so, so, so important. If you are really tech savvy and if you're a good programmer, you're going to have a lot of opportunities. Um, <clears throat> geoscientists, because we work with really, really complex problems, and a lot of these complex problems, either you can't see because, you know, say if you're trying to understand tectonics and you don't really exactly know what's going on underneath the surface, you're going to need to use a lot of very advanced technology, a lot of computer modeling and programming and simulations to really figure out what's going on. Um, it's also huge for anything with mapping, GIS, um, anything having to do with meteorology and climate and modeling <clears throat> and looking at weather and surface interactions, that type of thing. So I, you know, geoscience, sometimes it has a really bad rap, especially in some high schools. And I'm kind of making a blanket statement, so this does not apply everywhere. But specifically for me, um, in my high school, the, the earth science class typically was for students who were not college bound. And so people, I'm afraid, tend to think of geology and geoscience as the easy science. It's not as hard as physics. It's not as hard as chemistry or engineering or anything. And that's absolutely wrong. Geoscience actually incorporates all of the other sciences into it. And so because of that, you really need to have very strong math skills. Um, you really need to have very strong um, understanding of other sciences like physics, like chemistry. Engineering, you know, definitely wouldn't hurt, but that's, you know, if you want to go into engineering, there are a lot of geoscience engineering opportunities out there. And particularly for math, um, I would, even if you think that you're not good at math, just, I know it's a struggle, but keep at it. It's so important. And the more math you have, the more geoscience opportunities you're going to have um, once you graduate. So employers, honestly, are really looking for new hires who have who have those analytical skills and those problem-solving skills. And math gets you there. Um, they, you know, if you're going to go work at any big company and you're doing technical work, a lot of times you're going to be using a lot of linear algebra. You're going to be needing differential equations. And so if you can get through those, you know, the struggle of the calculus courses and get up to getting that linear algebra and the differential equations, that is so going to help you because we're getting to a point in our society and in our technology that you need the higher level math to really get places. Um, and that really, that includes all computer science as well, all of programming and stuff. So if you have those skills and if you really want to, you know, do this, I really highly recommend getting the math, getting the technical skills like that. Um, does geoscience have any tie in alternative energies or research in, into alternative energies? Yes, that is Definitely geoscience totally touches on that. I actually have a really good friend of mine um, and a colleague, and she is currently getting her PhD at Cornell University, and her whole research is on geothermal energy. And so it's trying to understand how can we harness and use efficiently energy that is already found from within the Earth, right? And so that's a form of alternative energy. Um, obviously, there are things like solar panels and wind energy and stuff like that that all touches on the geosciences. So, it definitely. Um, there is one specific question about paleontology. And he says um, he wants to go into paleontology, which is awesome, but there are no specific paleontology majors or minors at Oregon State. Um, will this hurt his chances of getting into grad school? Um, I really don't think it will hurt your chances at all. Um, honestly, again, it's about how you're using those transferable skills and how you're applying things. With paleontology, you're really going to be looking at a lot of 
said strat stuff. So if you really buff up on your said strat and those those diagenesis even would help you, um, those types of things, I think that will really be really good background for you. And again, going back to my own personal story, for grad school, remember I started in astronomy and planetary science, and then I switched to a graduate program in geology, and I did geoscience education. So it's really about almost marketing yourself. And the biggest thing to getting into grad school, quite honestly, and I know I probably sound like a broken record, is networking. Um, grad school, it's really hard to get into sometimes. But if you find a professor or an advisor who you want to do research with, make that contact. Like professors, a lot of times, are looking for students. And if you make that contact first before you apply and get to know that particular professor, that professor can help you get into that institution and get into that department. Um, so that's what happened to me. I found a couple different professors who, you know, I really liked. They really loved the research that I was doing as an undergrad. And they were like, yeah, I want, I want this student as my student. And so they actually got me in. So there are different ways about going into grad school. And I think that you should definitely follow what your interests are. But also, try not to be, like, don't pigeonhole yourself to be too specific because you can actually apply a lot of your interests and things to a lot of other big, broad ideas. So follow your interests, but also you want to try to market yourself, too. So I hope that helps you. Um, what colleges are considered the best for the geosciences? That's a really tough question because I don't, think that there's really a good answer because it honestly it really depends on what you want to do. Um, there are a lot of strong geoscience programs. Honestly, yeah, that's hard. I really don't know how to answer that question. If you, Dalton, want to email me personally, um, let me put up my email address here. Um, if you want to email me personally about some of your specific interests and the types of things you want to study, um, I can kind of give you a few ideas and options of what departments and universities have those types of things. That, that would be an option. Um, and again, if any of you ever have any questions um, that are specific um, that you want to email me about, there's my email. It's up on the screen. You can email me about anything, and I'd be happy, happy to get back to you on that. Let's see, a paleontology fan. Um, so there's someone who wants to know about the other types of paleo jobs that are beyond research and academia. And that's hard, because honestly, I think a lot of paleo does have to do with research and academia in general. A lot of paleontologists end up becoming professors and stuff. But if you think about it, Micropaleontology is huge because if you want to look at the microorganisms that existed in the past, those are actually great carbon reservoirs and carbon resources. So that applies to petroleum and energy extraction and development. Um, you can also work at federal agencies like NASA. So that, that would be another option. Um, or the USGS, they have paleontologists. You know, they do a lot of said strat work and stuff as well and trying to reconstruct um, histories and stuff too, like um, paleo history. So if you're into like paleo climate and paleo history, you can totally do stuff with that. And that's obviously very big right now too. How is the demand for artists in terms of geoscience careers? Um, and the question goes on to ask about graphic design or illustration would be better. That depends on um, what you're good at and kind of what you want to do. So graphic design, basically you can get into um, careers that help design websites, you know, like informational websites. Um, you can get into um, ebooks or textbooks. Uh, that help produce 
the images that actually teach about geoscience concepts. Um, illustration does that as well. I actually have a good friend um, who is a, um, she's a science illustrator and she has her, she has a master's in oceanography and then she went and got another master's in science illustration. And she actually is the one who produced that infographic image. And so because of her design skills and her design experience, she was able to help us. You know, she does a lot of things for Earth Magazine. That is AGI's magazine that we have. And so she does a lot of the illustrations there. Um, so there's publications, there's um, educational books and materials, ebooks, there's websites. So there's a lot of stuff out there. You just have to have the design skills and the knowledge to do that. Um, what are the prospects um, in the intelligence community? That is really, really big right now. Um, all about intelligence, international intelligence, all of that is very important. That's that whole thing you can, you know, work in the, you know, DOD, the government agencies. Um, it's really big right now. Um, and unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I want to try to keep this to an hour. Um, if I was unable to address any of your um, questions, if I wasn't able to read through all of them, um, please, please feel free to email me at any time. Um, you can email me with specific questions, general questions, and I will try my best to get back to you as soon as I can. So I want to thank you again all so much for participating. And again, um, this webinar is being recorded, so I will have this online um, hopefully sometime soon. And I will send you all the links so that way you can go back through and watch the video, go back through the slides, and revisit any of the information we discussed. So with that, thank you so much. And...